Welcome to our latest episode of Onco Daily, where today we have the honor of speaking with Dr. Sarkis Mitrisian. He's a distinguished figure in the realm of surgical oncology. After completing his residency in general surgery at McGill University's teaching hospitals, he further specialized with research and clinical fellowships at prestigious institutions like the New England Hospital in Boston and MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, under the mentorship of Dr. Charles Balch. In 1994, Dr. Metarisian brought his expertise back to McGill University, initially as an assistant professor of surgery and oncology, and later an associate dean of postgraduate medical education. His dedication to teaching has been recognized through numerous awards, including the Outstanding General Surgery Teacher and the Philip Wolfson Outstanding Teacher Award. Dr. Metarisian has also been a pivotal figure in surgical oncology societies, holding leadership positions in the Canadian Society of Surgical Oncology and Breast Surgery International. Join us as we delve into Dr. Metrician's inspiring career, his insights into the evolution of surgical oncology, and his perspective on medical education. Stay tuned for an enlightening conversation with a leader who has not only shaped the future of surgical oncology, but also played a crucial role in mentoring the next generation of medical professionals. All right. Uh, welcome, Dr. Metrician. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Rupen. All right. So, so Dr. Metarisen, can you share with me your journey from your initial medical studies in Montreal to becoming a professor of surgery and oncology at McGill University? How have these roles shaped your approach to surgical oncology? Thanks, uh, Rupen. Um, I, in medical school, if I go back to that time, I was always interested in surgery. Uh, the moment I started anatomy, it interested me very much, the dissection, uh, the human tissues. So that was the beginning of my interest in surgery. That blossomed during medical school. And interestingly, during residency, as I was trying to figure out where I was going to go in terms of su subspecialty, uh, you'll be intrigued to know that, ironically, when I went to rounds I, with surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, I noticed that the medical oncologists and radiation oncologists had a lot of knowledge of the biology, of, of the research, of the treatments available. And the surgeons, of course, were very good surgically. But however, they were, in many instances, uh, would do what the oncologists would tell them. And, and, and I asked myself, well, maybe... I want to become a surgical oncologist so that I don't want to be told what to do. I want to be part of that discussion. And so um, that was the interest that I had. Um, and so then, then I also like surgical oncology for the fact that it combines, as you know, uh, the best of research and clinical and gives you unique opportunities to do both. Yeah, I agree with you. It's, it's, it's very, I think the field of cancer of course, I haven't done surgical oncology, but the field of cancer by itself is very unique. It's it's <laughs> it's different. It's different beasts. It's different medicine. Like I think all the studies in medicine are on one hand, and oncology, medical, surgical, radiation. It's it's completely different world. And I got exposed late to oncology, um, which is unfortunate. That's how internal medicine training is. Like you get very small yeah. snippets, but I think it's it is actually it's one of the best fields out there. Agreed. Agreed, and 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 the, and I think the link between the surgeon and 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 his or her patient is is a link that cannot be reproduced in any other branch of surgery. You know, whether you do a gallbladder hernia, uh, the patient comes and goes. The cancer patient stays with you for years, decades, and they follow you and and they uh, they see you once a year. Um, it's a special bond that I I I, I feel privileged to have had over my career. Yeah, I completely agree. I just started my fellows a clinic and it's 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 nice. Like tomorrow I know I'm gonna see the same patient I saw a couple of weeks yeah. and we'll have some discussions about their kids, about their family, you know? Right. Um yeah. right. So let's shift gears about uh let's talk about uh, New England and MD Anderson. Uh what are the you you've done your fellowship there. So what were the key learnings that have influenced your career? 
Um, so this would be the first part of the question. And the second part I want to touch base on is like, you you were in Canada, like, and I, I did my uh, internal medicine residency in Canada, uh, and the education there is great. What led you also to leave Canada and seek more education? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, you have to remember back in 1990, when I finished my surgical residency, we didn't have very many fellowships in Canada. That's number one. Uh, there was no surgical oncology fellowships in Toronto, Montreal, uh, Calgary. Uh, now they all have fellowships and even more, there are even more cities with fellowships. So the second thing was I wanted to uh, go to a different place. I wanted to, to see how it's done in a, in, a, in a different place to bring new knowledge or new techniques back to, to McGill. And uh, you'll be surprised to know uh, that well, I, I being stubborn, I, I absolutely wanted to go to Sloan Kettering or MD Anderson. When I applied to those <laughs> institutions, I didn't get in. Oh, I wow. didn't get in in, in 1990. So I, I wrote them. I, I wrote them. I said, you know, could you please tell me why I didn't get in? And they told me, well, because you your CV is not uh, have enough publications. So that led me to say, okay, well, then we're going to fix that. And um, you know, Ar Armenians, we we don't uh, never, we get, <laughs> never defeat, say we're we're defeated. So I went, I, I went to Dana Farber. I went to the New England Deaconess, which was associated at the time with Dana Farber. I worked with someone by the name of Dr. Glenn Steele, who was a liver surgeon. And so I didn't do breast research. I did research on metastases to the liver, trying to understand their biology. Very successful two years. Didn't do any clinical work. Didn't touch a scalpel. Uh, very scary for me the first day at MD Anderson. So when I applied, I got in. And then I, then I went from 1990 to 92. I was pure research at uh, New England Deaconess. And then I went to MD Anderson. And I went into, like as you know, Sloan Kettering, MD Anderson, uh, the centers in the U.S. that specialize in cancer. I call them Disney worlds of cancer. Anything you want to do, they do. Uh, the trials, the research, the discussions, just the excitement of being at the uh, leading edge of cancer treatment and research was so exciting for me. And then we came back in 1994 to, uh, to, to uh, have my practice at McGill. Wow, that's very inspiring. And I, I just want to touch base on one point you mentioned that you spend almost two years studying yes. the Mets in the liver. In one of the previous episodes on Onco Daily, uh, we I, I met with Dr. Viernik and we talked about this topic. I, I want to grasp your mind, grab your mind. How do you feel that different metastases behave in different organs? Well, you know. We, we have progressed a lot uh, in, in, cancer, in the understanding of cancer biology, but the seed soil hypothesis uh, mm -hmm. was, was, was come up, they came up with that Pages many, many decades ago. And it still holds truth that, uh, and, and now we're understanding why that is the case. So colon cancer going to liver, sarcoma is going to lung. Um, you know, uh, uveal melanoma is going to the eye, uh, going to the liver. And so, uh, you know, and, and certain types of breast cancer, like triple negative, going to the brain, and then others going to bone. So it's very interesting. And we're under, beginning to understand more and more as we're getting into the genomic analysis of, of tumors and their metastases. So I think it's fascinating. And we have made such progress. When I was a resident, we didn't, um, even the cure rate of breast cancer was in the 60s, 70s. Now we're in the 90s. And the cure rate of liver metastases was barely 25%. And now colon cancer with the true and newer treatments and new surgical approaches exceeds 50%. So it's really amazing. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's very fascinating. And I think now with the technology is like uh, getting faster and faster. We are learning more about our genomes. For example, like companies like 23andMe uh, yeah. have like tons of genomic data and we have the large mm -hmm. language models. So the combination of both, is very fascinating and exciting for the field. I think this is the best time to be oncologist, surgical oncologist, medical oncologist, or radiation oncologist. I agree. I agree very much. Uh, although like any time, 
uh, in 30, 40 years, people will look back and say, I can't believe they were operating on breast cancer because then they're going to, because of the genomic analysis and newer treatments, um, maybe we'll do biopsies and then we'll treat the, ca the cancers um, by intravenous treatments or maybe by local injections or radiotherapeutic approaches. So I think the, the, it's amazing, even in my career, how cancer knowledge and treatment has evolved. And if it changes, and breast cancer is one that changes almost monthly, let alone mm -hmm. yearly. Yeah, yeah. We, we before we started the episode, you were talking about your students, and it's it's, it's very inspiring to see that despite everything you've achieved, you are still heavily involved in mentorship and education. And I want to shift gears toward my next question. So you've been recognized for your educational excellence, including being on the McGill faculty honor list and receiving the Association of Surgical Education Outstanding Teacher Award. What drives you? What, what's going on in your mind that motivates you so much to give back to your students? You know, Rupert, I, I love research. I love clinical work. But early in my career, I realized that I could make a real impact on young people, um, I can I can influence them even if they don't become surgeons, even though they, even even if they don't become oncologists, I can try to influence them to be uh, caring doctors, good doctors, and 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 you know, a good teacher. And I'm sure you're the same. You, if I told you, if I asked you who were your mentors, you won't, you'll remember them, and and those mentors you never forget. So I said to myself, you know, I'm going to make an impact on these young people. And even if, you know, you and I are, are, are uh, you know, we're, do, we're doing very well in our careers, but, you know, the Nobel Prizes, it hit me that, you know, the Nobel Prize is, a, is fantastic. And, 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 you know, an Armenian won one recently, as you know. But if I challenged you and asked you who won the Nobel Prize in medicine in 1987, uh, you know, but if I, ch if I told you, tell, give me your mentor in medical school, you will say it in a second. And yes. who is your mentor in residency? You will give me the name. And so um, that's why I said, you know, I want to make a mark for myself one student at a time. That's very inspiring. Actually, that, that, that's very deep because like literally, because I, I don't know who got the Nobel Prize in 1970, but I, I remember very well one of my best mentors in residency, like he, despite he was an accomplished researcher. And for me, being accomplished means like, publishing a New England Journal of yeah. Medicine or one of those oh, big yeah. names. Despite uh, that, like he used to meet with me every two weeks. And uh, I remember him very well. And before leaving Ottawa, like I went there, I hugged him, brought him a gift because like he made a huge difference in my life. You brought him a gift. Like that is special. Um, so he, he influenced you. And that's mm -hmm. something that a New England Journal paper is fantastic. But if he influences 20 people like you, he's made a difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, I want to talk about more about your research. Um, could you share some insights on your current research, uh, especially about breast cancer and melanoma? And how do you see your current research topics are contributing to the general field of oncology? I'm very excited to hear what you're working on. So I, all of my research is in the area of breast cancer. I do clinical work in melanoma, but my research is breast. And my research in breast cancer can be divided into two parts. Uh, I work on the wellness, kind of the, the non-medical uh, treatments of our patients. And I'll explain that to you in a second. And then, and then I also work on translational research. So on the uh, non-medical, I'm very, I've been always interested in how to improve patients' lives after a diagnosis of breast cancer. And I'm not talking about chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, all those things we've done tremendous advances, we're curing disease, but you know, we're, we have a human being behind the disease. So we say, wow, it's fantastic, we're so good, we cured the cancer, but did we heal the patient? And they're sometimes broken, they have trouble going back to work, their marriage breaks apart, uh, they have trouble concentrating, chemo brain, um, difficult uh, relations to, with their loved ones. And those are things that 
we in medicine, we haven't paid enough attention to. So I have a grant, I have two grants, one from two, both from the Quebec Breast Cancer Foundation, one looking at the influence of a life coach in the, in, re, in the integration of a breast cancer patient after treatment, randomized between having a coach and not having a coach, and you know, looking at their adaptation to life, looking at their coping skills, anxiety, trying to see how we can decrease that. Because as you know well, you can treat a patient today, cure them in six months, and you say, and in five years we call them cured, but have they really uh, been able to reintegrate? That's the question. Now, I just recently got a grant looking at Nurse Navigator, because we have a rapid diagnostic clinic, trying to ask the question, does a Nurse Navigator uh, decrease the anxiety, stress, and improve coping skills of our patients as they come in for biopsies? Because many patients come in and they don't know what's going to happen. First of all, they may not have cancer, but if they do, they don't even know what biopsy they're going to get. So we're trying to look at how to make the journey easier for the patient. So that's a lot of the work that I'm doing in breast cancer. Um, we also have, uh, I'm involved in the clinical trials group in Quebec called the uh, peak sirois that brings together 11 mm -hmm. hospitals and universities together. And in that area, I was lucky enough that I got inspired by the Canadian uh, kidney database, kidney cancer database. So I decided to see if we could start a metastatic breast cancer database. There isn't one in Canada. There is one in BC Cancer Agency, has put one in BC, there's Princess Margaret, but province-wide, no. And so now with pharmaceutical companies and the Canadian Cancer Society, we were I was able to establish a um, breast metastasis registry that we have over 600 patients oh, trying wow. to look at the real world evidence. Because as you know, a lot of met metastatic patients are treated on a compassionate basis. They get medications that are not on trial and nobody really studies these results. Now we're gonna be able to study the results. And that's why the pharmas are so interested and they're throwing money at us because they want more and more patients and they wanna study patients uh, and, and the effect, effectiveness of the treatments. Now, in the translational side, I'm very interested in, in better understanding uh, two areas. I'm, I'm involved with a very bright young researcher looking at circulating DNA. And with the oh, breast yeah. metastasis registry, trying to ask the question, can we use circulating DNA as a marker of response to therapy in metastatic breast cancer and mm -hmm. as a... Uh, predictor of recurrence. So, so we have um, a, a grant from a, a private uh, family here that we made an application to, to get preliminary data using our metastasis registry, combining that with the basic science of circulating DNA and, and sequencing the tumor that belongs to that patient because we have, in order to see if there's the correlation with the circulating DNA. And then, and then of course, the last area that I have a grant, we just got a grant as well on DCIS progression to invasive cancer. What uh, influences it? What's the molecular biology of it? Because I'm convinced that we overtreat a lot of patients with ductal carcinoma in situ, that we give them radiation, we give them anti-hormone pills, as you know, and, um, and some of these patients are never gonna have a problem with their DCIS. So which DCIS should we treat? Which one should we not treat? We really don't know the answer right now. We treat everybody the same. A lot of studies are being done to try to um, uh, determine if you can de-escalate de the treatment, but we're trying to understand the molecular biology of TCIS. Uh, Dr. Matrician, you touched on many, many points that are very fascinating. And I just want to circle back. You mentioned several yes, things, and I want to grab your mind. I think one of the things that you brought up, and it's something I see in my clinic and my patients every day, we discuss lots of trials. This treatment was better, treatment X was better than treatment Y by, for example, 4% and improved survival by four months. So it got approved because there is nothing else available. But none of these trials are taking into account the patient's quality of life on treatment X and treatment Y. And you brought up very important points, like those patients get broken up financially, emotionally, from family side. Um, how is 
your experience and how you discuss those, how, how can you discuss this with your patient beyond the numbers that clinical trials give you? How can you talk to them about how is your quality of life is going to be on treatment X versus treatment Y? Well, you know, it's a difficult discussion, but, and sometimes it's, the discussion is, it comes from areas of uncertainty because we really don't know um, if in this particular patient, uh, one of those treatments may be in the five to 10% or 20% of patients that will respond and may uh, be, uh, be a long-term survivor. So my discussions usually center around the fact that, as you said, sometimes we don't have many choices. Uh, why don't we try uh, to put you on the trial? But if you become severely symptomatic or disease progression, then we should take a step back. And then we should say, okay, we tried. Um, and maybe now when we have a better idea of what, whether the patient has a limited lifespan or is curable, then we make a decision. Either we go palliative or we continue being aggressive. So I think all my career, I've tried to balance what, what are the life expectancies versus the um, uh, treatment uh, side effects. And when a patient is curable, we have to be even more careful because we don't want to, uh, for example, operate and do a full X-ray dissection and find all the lymph nodes are negative, And then they get lymphedema, which they have to live with for life. And they die at 89 their arm is, and they've had a terrible life because they've had to deal with an arm which is four times the size of their normal arm. And uh, we give them anti-hormone pills that gives them hot flashes and bone pains that are far exceeding, as you say, the percentage. One thing I do do, Rupen, is I'm very careful to explain to them the absolute survival advantage. For example, if it's 3% on 10%, I never will say 30%. I will always say, you know, I will try to explain to them that there's 10% uh, survival or recurrence. And if you take the pill, it'll be 7%. So that they understand that the, uh, the true advantage is 3%. So then I, I, and I explain to them that is 3% important to you? And I'm very careful because as you know, one patient, they want everything. 1%, give it to me. The other patient will say, no, no, no. 10% is my cutoff. And so I'm very careful to kind of match the treatments with the patient's character and give them factual data. Gotcha. Also, you mentioned that you were able to fund your research by grants from a family. I think one of the things that researchers always uh, uh, struggle with is having in enough a grant, but I, I, this is the, one of the few times that I hear like creative way of uh, financing or funding your research. C can you, bit, if, if that's okay, like expand more on your experience? How were you able to uh, work with this family who were able to grant this or fund this research to help answer uh, important questions? Sure. I I'll tell you two stories, in fact. Well, one that you'll find fascinating, but maybe you already found that story in the on the internet. But I'll tell you the second story first. For the family, uh, breast cancer, we're lucky. You know, we're not an orphan disease. Uh, we're not like melanoma, pancreatic cancer. You know, breast cancer uh, has a lot of people, a lot of people have breast cancer. A lot of uh, people with means will contact us and say, you know, we would like to make a donation. And is that, but we like to make it to a specific project. And that's when we get together in our milieu with, um, you know, the, whether it's a clinical project or we get together, as I said, with this basic scientist who's look, working on circulating DNA and say, hey, there's a family. In this case, the family was want, wanting to give 200,000. There's a family who wants to donate 200,000. I think we could use this money to do research in the area of metastatic breast cancer with your expertise of circulating DNA and my uh, breast metastasis registry, why don't we put that together and we come up with a proposal which the family liked. Uh, the, second thing I, the second thing I was gonna to talk to you about is in 2021, in the middle of COVID, um, every year we have fundraisers for breast cancer. We have a gala dinner. We raise usually between 150 and 200. We use that money from any, everything from equipment to uh, funding trainees or fellows or to, to do fun research. 
But during COVID, we couldn't do any of these events. So the foundation said, you know, Dr. Medarissian, how about if you shave your head for breast cancer? So <laughs> I said initially, my initial response was, are you crazy? But then my wife encouraged me. So for one year from October 2020 to October 2021, I did not cut my hair. And if you look on the internet, you'll see uh, when you look under images, it's easy to find me with very long hair. Then two days before I dyed my hair pink on October 20th, 2022. And then I shaved my head bald and I raised, and now hold on to your seat there, Rupen. I raised $347,000. Oh, wow. This is so, unbelievable. And when I started, they said, how much will it take for you to cut your hair? I said, if I raise 50, I will cut my hair. And I was thinking, who's going to get 50? But but <laughs> we, first of all, uh, the company, Pfizer gave 25, Gilead gave 12, um, AstraZeneca gave 15, Avon matched every dollar up to 200,000. So, and the patients gave the rest. So we finished with $347,000. So that was another way to fund projects and uh, not not a way. I mean, guys like you can do it, Rupen. You have a lot of hair, but <laughs> I have uh, a lot of <laughs> not an easy way to raise money. But, um, you know, I was on the front page of the newspaper, doctor shaves his head for breast cancer. So it was, I was really happy. And the patients were so uh, 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 understanding and so happy that I was doing that. The patients who had lost their hair during chemo and one of them gave me even a hat. They said, you're gonna be cold when oh, you you're bald. And they were right, I was cold because I cut my hair in October and it took uh, months, like three, four months for it to grow, but I'm doing well. <laughs> you're doing <a> amazing. <laughs> so that, that is a very thing. inspiring a story. That is very inspiring story. I'm like, I'm a speechless. It's like, it's, it's fantastic. Like in my mind, because like the only way to fund your research is like go to different organizations and apply and, but like you became so creative in but finding ways I to answer done, your questions. Yeah, I was, but anyway, make me happy after this phone call. And also for people who view this, just Google me and Google uh, the images. You'll see what I mean. You'll, you'll see pictures <laughs> of me with pink hair and bald head. All right. So before shifting gears and talking about the surgical oncology in Canada, I want to ask you uh, specific questions to yourself. What advice would you give your younger self 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago? What would you, if you are now talking to yourself, what would you say? I would say uh, enjoy the journey more than the destination. Um, it's easy to say that at my age and maybe less so for you, but you know, you know, in life, um, in academia, and, and, I, and, I, and I hope one day, Rupert, I guess you're gonna come back to Canada and, and I look I will, forward I will. to it. And, but, you know, it's natural and, and you know, all of us, Armenian, Armenian trait is we're push, you know, we push, we, our parents always pushed us, right? And, you know, assistant professor, associate professor, full professor, tenure, research, publish, grants. Let's take a deep breath. And I would say to myself, what happens will happen. Work hard, I'm not denying it, but uh, take time. And, and I was very careful and I could have probably done more. I have three kids. Now I have two grandchildren, but oh, and wow. you have to ask my kids to get the truth. I personally think that I tried my best to spend as much time with them as possible. But anybody listening, I think, especially the young, the young folks who are up and coming uh, generation like you, who will replace all of us, um, enjoy the journey. Uh, don't forget to take care of yourself. And you will be uh, very famous in your area, in your institution, and you'll be proud of yourself, uh, I am sure, uh, but uh, you can never forget your own health as well as the health and, and love of your loved ones. So take, I would say take, your, take the time to appreciate the uh, good things in life as you're moving up the ladder. Can I ask you one more question on that? Because I, yeah. I'm still struggling with it. How do you find you could balance academia, research, 
um, and personal life? The only way, at least you can try, like I'm not, like I said to you, in order to get the true answer, you have to ask my children, you say, did Dr. Medrissian spend time with you? Like he's saying, but the only way you can do it is to always remind yourself that um, I have to go home. I, I, I can't stay until seven every night. Um, I'm not saying that if you have a grand deadline tomorrow, you have to stay, but you can't stay till seven, 7.30. Your daughter or your son has a concert. You have to go. So I think as much as you push yourself, you say, tonight I'm going to interview Dr. Medarissian. Tomorrow I'm going to finish my paper. Next week I'm going to prepare my talk. You have to say the same things to yourself about your daughter's concert, your son's baseball game, and so on. You say, no, next week I got to go to, no, I can't. No, sorry, I can't do the interview. Or sorry, I can't be at the meeting. And if you, you, it's a, it's a, it's an effort. It takes a lot of effort, but because it's natural for you to go to the meeting, to to write the paper, to you know, to have the deadline. But and the family will always say it's okay, it's okay. But deep down, it's not okay. And I think if you make the time, you will be very happy when you're uh, 55, 60 years old, and you look back at your life. Yeah, I think that's this is very important. I I, I do fall into those mistakes where like. I, I think like any other uh, young oncologist, you, you push yourself harder and harder and harder, but I think it's, it's very important to stop and uh, yeah. take a deep breath. Yeah, I mean, and look where you're you at the time of your life, Rupen, that like I was at MD Anderson, you're now doing your fellowship, you know, but a time will come when the fellowship is done and now you have life plus your career. And I think it's uh, finding the balance is a, is, a, is a daily reminder to yourself, stop take time for yourself all right i will try to do that more often now let's talk about the surgical oncology in canada in every episode in uncle daily we talk about the, the practice of uh, oncology in different countries how do you think the canadian healthcare system with its unique features influence the practice of surgical oncology especially i want to understand your perspective about patient access to care and to treatment? So first of all, surgical oncology has evolved uh, by leaps and bounds uh, since I was a resident. Uh, there were no fellowships in Canada, um, whether it's surgical oncology, medical or radiation. I mean, it was much more medical and radiation, of course. But um, so that's number one. Um, number two is that um, the access to care doesn't compare to the U.S. in the sense that I love being at MD Anderson, and uh, but I always felt very uneasy with. I remember we had a service where we ran the service and we had to sign uh, our invoices. I don't know five thousand dollars for this, three thousand for that, um, and and I remember even when my wife delivered our second child was born in Houston, there was a sign at the desk saying, if you do not have insurance, please go to an, another hospital. So I think that I'm, I'm privileged, and you will be, to work in a place where you don't have to ask yourself, is this person insured for me to treat them? That's, that's um, amazing. Now, you can then say, oh, yeah, okay, but the U.S., they have more access to clinical trials. I'd say, you know, I, I would tell you no. Whether you're in Toronto, Calgary, Vancouver, any city, and now the smaller ones, Ontario with their uh, different uh, cancer centers in Quebec as well. Um, I don't think there's a problem with access to trials. Now you could argue in the smaller towns in Ontario or Quebec, a woman with breast cancer won't have the same access. I would give it to you, but I'm not sure that the woman in the small town in Texas or Michigan may have the same problem. Um, and especially if the insurance company doesn't pay for her to go to the university center. So I, so, so I think that the access to clinical trials is amazing. Um, the access to medications and, and uh, our knowledge and our ability to implement the latest in the trials is comparable to anywhere else. And, and as you know, and, and you may know, is that when it came to clinical trials, NSABP, for example, Canada was the leader 
uh, even better than the U.S. when they were doing the trials of total mastectomy versus partial. They were doing the trials of key, different chemotherapeutic regimens. Um, always the Canadian centers were entering patients much more quickly than the American centers. So I think that um, the care is is uh, very comparable and you don't have to be rich to get the care. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Like I, I also went through that cultural shock between Canada and the US. In Canada, I never thought about like what, who should, chemo yeah. authorization is not a thing. Medication authorization is not a thing. Like if no. the medication is appropriate, you can order it. Yeah. But in the US, like uh, I've been going through this as well. Like it's like you have to make sure there is chemo art. And then if the treatment is refused, you have to justify that. You have to mention the note. Um, although we pay more taxes, relatively speaking, that's what I've been told in Canada. But I don't mind. My dad had open heart surgery last year or two years ago in the oh Ottawa Heart Institute. And I paid <laughs> Nothing like open heart surgery. I, I prefer to pay taxes, uh, extra yep. taxes, than finding an insurance that might or might not cover uh, some options. No, so I really enjoy. Uh, I mean, look, I, I, whether you're in, in your hospital, if you stay there, which we don't want you to stay there, we want you to come back to Canada. <laughs> but if you stay there, I've no doubt that uh, Rupin uh, or the Bashian's uh, CV may be a bit richer than he would be if he came back to Ottawa because he would be thrown resources. But at the same time, back to the uh, your life work um, balance, uh, let me tell you, uh, if I stayed at, at MD Anderson, <clears throat> I would be forced uh, to work uh, 7 p.m. most nights and, and push, push, push. Yeah, 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 I agree. Um... <clears throat> I want I want to go back to to the past couple of years, you know, like that pandemic everyone heard about the COVID nineteen, mm -hmm. uh, and there was lots of surgical slowdown. How mm -hmm. did the COVID nineteen pandemic uh, and how did the surgical slowdown impact cancer care uh, in Quebec and in Canada? And uh, what lessons did you learn uh, when you went through this, and especially when it comes to managing healthcare resources? Well, I can tell you that we're feeling the repercussions of the slowdown now, at least in Quebec. Um, before, in my own hospital, before COVID, we used to see 450 breast cancers a year. Now we're touching 700. And it's because women were not going for a screening mammograms during COVID. So we're getting the regular patients, plus we're getting all these other patients who unfortunately are coming with locally advanced disease. So I think that we kind of were so preoccupied. I mean, I'm not I'm not talking about me or you, but the governments were so preoccupied with COVID that uh, nothing else mattered. And I could never understand that. And I <laughs> I remember I, I remember like cancer patients, you know, were waiting and I, and I published a paper where we published it in surgery where we were giving patients aromatase inhibitors. And because the patients were on average waiting three or four months for their surgery. So we're giving them AIs to uh, ERPR positive tumors because they were only allowing us to operate on triple negative or HER2, but those patients were getting neoadjuvant chemo, thank God. But the other ones, they would not let us operate unless there were big tumors. And so, so we were putting them all on uh, aromatase inhibitors. And we showed in that paper, luckily, that the tumors did not grow in those four months. So uh, but that's not the way to practice medicine. So I agree with you that we were cancer was neglected as were other diseases during COVID and now we're paying the price. And now we have so many cancers. It is really, that's one difference. You know, you asked me before, the difference in the US would be if I had a long wait list, they would call me and give me more OR time. At my institution now, I don't know if it's the same in Ottawa or Toronto, there's a there's not enough uh, nursing or not enough uh, anesthesia to even if they want to give me extra OR time there's not there there aren't the resources so now the patients are back to waiting about eight weeks for their surgery so um, that's that's a big difference now will it make a difference it won't for ninety five percent of people but I always worry about that patient who may have a problem and um, biologically waiting eight weeks. So, so I must say that uh, that's the only one I'll give you is that if tomorrow 
who need extra resources for even chemo. We're waiting now four weeks. If I give them, a, before I used to call them and say, you know, can you start chemo? Uh, because the, the patient was a borderline indication. And now so that they tell me, well, whether you operate in eight weeks or I give chemo in six weeks. So there's a, that's the major difference I'd give you, uh, Rupen. It's not our knowledge, not the trials, not the chemos. It's the resources in, the, in Canada compared to the U.S. Gotcha. And it's gotten worse post-COVID. All right. Um, talking about uh, the challenges that we face but also challenges always come with opportunities. Uh, mm. Now we talked about the past. I want to focus a bit about the future. Uh, what do you see the most significant challenge and opportunity in the field of surgical oncology, in your opinion? Well, the the biggest uh, challenge. Well, you know, the I there's the challenge is the Canadian challenge, which is resources. But if I have to look at a worldwide uh, challenge of surgical oncology, it's uh, going to be both a challenge and an opportunity is how to de-escalate uh, our surgery. Uh, and the opportunity I'm gonna throw it is, is the genetic knowledge of cancer. In the sense that when I, get, when I gave the presidential address for Breast Surgery International, I argued, and, and, I, and I, it wasn't well received, that by the time I retire or uh, by 2035, uh, we're not going to do breast surgery for cancer anymore because we're going to do genomics and we will do biopsies. But surgical oncology will be mainly prophylactic surgery because we're going to learn more about genetic mutations and we're going to understand more specifics about it and more patients are going to go for prophylactic mastectomy. So I think the opportunity is in better understanding of the molecular biology of cancer, which will help the surgical oncologist better understand their tumor and better treat the tumor. Yes, it's gonna cause less surgery. And as we advance in the, in the medical treatments, but that's it, that's, that's what's gonna happen. But we're gonna be in the, in, you know, whether it's taking out a pancreas, taking out a stomach, taking out a breast, because they have genetic predisposition to cancer. I think that's what's gonna happen uh, by the time, well, I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen in the next 30 years. And, and, and of course, I'll just throw in there the huge influence that AI is going to have so that um, when we have tumor board, if, I, if I'm with you, you're going to tell me about a trial. I'm going to tell you about a trial. But if we have AI, AI will tell us about a trial that we didn't even read about from China or from Japan or uh, from Australia that we may have missed. So the knowledge that AI is going to bring to the table will revolutionize, I think, um, uh, our, our ability to, to select treatments for patients in an appropriate fashion, select the right treatment for the patient that we may, and, and knowledge ex is expanding so rapidly that it's impossible for you and I to keep up with the knowledge. And we'll need AI um, as AI evolves and becomes a more, uh, I guess, tangible, useful uh, thing for us. I think it's going to come in next year, two years, three years, that when you have tumor board, you're going to have an AI uh, uh, helping you uh, make sure that you haven't missed uh, a trial or missed the treatment option. I completely agree. I completely agree. AI is actually one of my research projects. That's that, that's my research focus, AI. And I'm currently working with a, uh, with a company in California that are trying to bring AI to oncology. And mm. that's I, I just published a paper about using ChatGPT, uh, testing ASCO on ChatGPT, and then ASCO Question Bank on ChatGPT. And then I'm, I'm launching another paper about real life clinical cases on chat. So I, it, it's very fascinating. It's okay. very fascinating. I'm going to PubMed you then. Or oh, that Bastian is yes. look up. Okay, because I'm very interested. You know, because it's very what's... fascinating. Because Watson, you know, Watson, you know, the IBM Watson. Yes, I know IBM. And MD yeah. Anderson had a, uh, had a contract with them. It, it failed. But I think we're at the stage where it's almost like um, Atari. I don't know, you're too young to know about Atari, but Atari. No, no, I know a, Atari. I use Atari. Okay. I Atari. <laughs> it was a video game, but, but that was the, and now we've gotten to the, uh, you know, virtual reality video games. So, and I think the same thing is going to happen with AI. 
we're at the beginnings of AI. And then now in four or five years or earlier, maybe two years, we're going to have a AI 3.1, then 5.2. And it's going to be amazing. I, I completely agree. I completely agree with that. And um, I think, so what happened with IBM, in my opinion, it was like, the right technology about the wrong time uh, in in the startup board or in uh, when you start something like you have to have the right technology in the right time for example uber as an idea wouldn't succeed if you didn't have mobile phone with a like a military accuracy gps device right. so the technology had to be there and i think right now the technology is there so we need companies to step up and take the initiative to bring that technology to healthcare. And unfortunately, healthcare is a bit slow to adapt to technology when compared to other technology, yes, uh, other fields. But if we demonstrate its utility uh, that we didn't get initially, I think we will see if the companies demonstrate how it can help us, I think it will be adopted. I agree, I agree. All right, that brings us to the end of the episode. Thank you so much. That was very fun conversation. I really enjoyed I every it, moment of it. It was it was very fun, and and I uh, I think you uh, you you're the.